Hi guys, I'm Dee Dee West and this is Broken Limelight. In this episode, I'm going to talk about baby groupies and rock stars who had relationships with underage girls. Baby groupies was a name given to young girls who frequented rock concerts and slept with band members. I'm talking like ages 13 and up. And it's surprising that these rock stars are huge, super well-known dudes and they got away with openly having these relationships for the most part. Some of these rock stars include David Bowie, Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin, and Steven Tyler, the lead singer of Aerosmith. Before anybody comes at me telling me to let these men rest in their graves or live their lives, no. These men are pedophiles and I don't think we should idolize them or glorify them. I admit I'm a huge classic rock fan and I've been a fan of some of these guys on this list, but I don't want to idolize these creeps. In the words of Bailey Sarian, get better idols. And to be honest, the more I learn about them, the more I just can't even enjoy their music. I don't really get it when people say things like, I can separate the artists from the music. Like that's something to be pr proud of. But we can agree to disagree on that one. So I'm sure it's not a huge surprise that some rock stars had their share of sexual conquests with young teenage girls. Somehow. Most of these guys managed to get away with it and with sleeping with girls much younger than a lot of us might have expected. So first I'm going to tell you about two of the most famous baby groupies because they were pretty much famous. Their names are Lori Maddox and Sable Star. So Lori Maddox, she started off as a model in a magazine called Star Magazine. Star Magazine basically had basically preteen girls, like 12, 13 year old girls, and they would like vogue them up, dressed head to toe in designer clothes, and they would have their makeup and hair all done. They basically made them look like 20 to 30 year old models. Lori Maddox and Sable Star went to middle school together and they were friends. Sable Star was a well-known groupie. She was pretty well known among the stars and Lori was fascinated by this. She was quoted as saying, Sable Star lived to fuck rock stars. She was so glamorous, totally one of a kind, wearing scarves for shirts and going topless without hesitation. So Lori started tagging along with Sable to go to the clubs and meeting the rock stars, and it wasn't long before she got noticed as well. Lori has stated that she lost her virginity to David Bowie when she was 14 years old while he was in his 20s. According to her, Bowie initially pursued her and she rejected him. She said, I had not yet turned 15 and he wanted to take me to his hotel room. I was still a virgin and terrified. I had probably kissed boys by that point, but I wasn't ready for David Bowie. Then a few months later, David Bowie saw her and asked her out again, and this time she said yes. At the time, Sable Star had been dating Iggy Pop, but apparently she said she had been dying to fuck David Bowie. So Lori says that they both went over to his hotel and Lori and David Bowie got into the bathtub and he took her virginity. Then afterwards they went and got Sable and they went into the bedroom and they had a threesome. Lori's actually better known for another relationship that she was in with guitarist from Led Zeppelin, Jimmy Page. According to her, he actually kidnapped her at one point with the help of his manager. What happened was I was kidnapped, literally, and um, he told me he was going to be with me, and I said, no, he wasn't, and he said, yes, I am, and then we all ended up at the Rainbow, and we were at the Rainbow, and Richard Cole says to me, get in the bloody car, and if you move, I'll have your head, and next thing you know, we're at the hotel, I'm walking down the hall, next thing you know, I'm pulled into this door, and there I was basically kidnapped and I turn around and look and there's Jimmy sitting in the corner of the room with a hat and a cane saying I told you I'm gonna have you. If you're a Led Zeppelin fan that manager Richard Cole was also the one who was responsible for the famous shark incident. The rest of that interview is kind of weird. She goes on to say that he would keep her locked in a room with his security and that she wasn't really allowed to go very many places but while she's saying it, she's like giggling and chuckling. And then at the end of the interview, she's like, it was beautiful. Eventually, Jimmy started sleeping around and Lori walked in on him having sex with Phoebe Buell. 
Phoebe Buell is another really famous groupie. She's better known today as Liv Tyler's mother. Sable Star, like I mentioned before, dated Iggy Pop. He wrote a song about her called Look Away. Some of the lyrics say, I slept with Sable when she was 13. Her parents were too rich to do anything. She walked her way around to L.A. till a New York doll carried her away. Iggy Pop is about 10 years older than Sable. She's also known for having a relationship with Johnny Thunders from the New York Dolls. She was 16 at the time, and their relationship was very toxic and abusive. She said, after I was with him, I just wasn't Sable Star anymore. He really destroyed the Sable Star thing. He made me throw away all my diaries and all my phone numbers down the incinerator, and he ripped up my scrapbook. Johnny Thunders was really abusive, and he was also a really jealous guy. He would have these drug-induced fits of paranoia and beat her senseless. So one day they found out that Sable was pregnant, and Johnny proposed to her. But Sable realized what her future would look like, so she actually snuck off, and she decided to leave the groupie world behind. Sable had been a groupie since she was about 12 years old. Steven Tyler was another rock star that had an inappropriate relationship with an underage girl. Julia Holcomb had just turned 16 years old when she went to an Aerosmith concert and she met the lead singer, Steven Tyler. Before she met him, she didn't have a very happy life. Her father had abandoned her mother early on and her younger brother died in a car accident when she was 13. So she was in a pretty vulnerable place when she met a 24-year-old groupie who groomed her and dressed her in revealing clothing and helped her sneak backstage to this Aerosmith concert. Julia had said, I went to the concert hoping to meet Steven, and after the concert, we met for the first time. At that time, I thought he was the best thing in my life. My sad, vulnerable story, as well as my youth and personal attractiveness, captured his interest. Shortly after the concert, she left with him to Boston. Steven Tyler then contacted her mother and got her to sign over guardianship to him. Julia was in disbelief. She could not believe that her mom actually did it. So she asked him, how did you get her to do it? And he said, I told her I needed them to enroll you in school. Julia says that she remembers feeling vulnerable knowing that she was under his control at this point. The two of them ended up getting pretty serious and apparently they wanted to have children. Julia said, I wanted children and began to believe he must truly love me since he had made himself my guardian and was asking to have children with me. He threw my birth control pills off the balcony of the hotel where we were staying into the street far below. Within a year, I became pregnant. I had never been pregnant before, contrary to what Stephen has written. Stephen proposed to her and they were engaged, but apparently Stephen's father thought that she was too immature to be his wife and His grandmother didn't approve of it either, so he ended up breaking it off, and she felt totally betrayed. She had said, For the first time, I realized I should not have been foolish enough to conceive a child outside of marriage with a man who might not be interested in a lifelong relationship. His guardianship of me complicated things further. I was subordinate to him as in a parent relationship, and I felt I had little control over my life. In the fall of 1975, Stephen went on tour and left Julia in the apartment alone. He gave her a little bit of money, but it wasn't enough for her. So she called him and told him that she needed more money to get groceries. And he told her, don't worry, I'll send Ray over tomorrow and he'll take you grocery shopping. Ray was somebody who had been in his band in the past and was now kind of like a, an assistant guy. He just was, he was like a roadie. He did a bunch of stuff to help out with the band. So. The next day, I I guess she was really excited because she had been alone in that apartment for weeks, and she was just really excited to go somewhere and get out of that place. So she says that she was sitting on the couch just excitedly waiting for him, and he finally showed up, and she let him in, and he offered her a line of cocaine. She says that that was strange because she was seldom offered cocaine, but she took it, and she says that she stood up and was like, okay, let's go. And all of a sudden, she got hit with this wave of sleepiness. And she says that she, she couldn't fight it. She was like, okay, I need to lay down for a minute. And then she passed out. Julia woke up to a cloud of black smoke all over her apartment. She tried to crawl over to her door, 
where apparently Steven had like three or four different locks, like a chain lock and a deadbolt lock and like a metal bar. For some reason, I think like in case cops came to raid the house for drugs or something. But she tried to get out and apparently the metal bar had been jammed. So she was trapped. And by the way, Ray was not around. He was gone. So she said that there was only one other way she could get out. It was down some stairs that led to a kitchen and a back door. So she tried to get down there, but she started becoming like overwhelmed by the smoke and she ended up passing out. Fortunately, firefighters showed up to the house and rescued her and she later woke up in a hospital. While Julia was still in the hospital, Steven Tyler pressured her to get an abortion. She said that he spent over an hour pressuring her and told her that she was too young to have a baby and that it was going to have brain damage because of the fire and because she had taken drugs that day. She continued to say no over and over again, and she said that she shouldn't be asked to make that decision while still in the hospital. But he said that she had to have the abortion right now because in a week it would become illegal. That's when Steven Tyler threatened to abandon her and send her back to her mother's house to have a baby. She says that she crumbled. She said, I believed he was abandoning me as my father and my mother had. I began to cry and agreed to have the abortion. By this point, Stephen had actually already been cheating on Julia with Phoebe Buell, who had become pregnant with his daughter, Liv Tyler. Julia said, Stephen was already involved with other women at that time. The fact that he was my guardian complicated things for him because he was legally responsible for me. I was young, had dropped out of high school, and did not understand my legal rights at the time. I felt completely powerless. I left Stephen in February 1977 and returned to live with my mother and stepfather. Stephen called a few times after I returned home, and then I never heard from him again. Stephen Tyler has publicly spoken about the abortion and how it affected him, but he hasn't actually acknowledged how he messed up Julia. Bill Wyman was the bassist for the Rolling Stones. He was 47 years old when he started having sex with 14-year-old Mandy Smith. The two got married when she was 18 years old, but their marriage did not last very long. Shortly after they split up, Bill Wyman's son, Stephen Wyman, announced that he was getting married to Patsy Smith, the mother of Mandy Smith. That's fucking weird, right? Those two divorced after just two years. Just in case you were wondering, he was 30 years old when they got married, and she was 46. Another Rolling Stone who had a sexual relationship with an underage girl was frontman Mick Jagger. He had a two-day fling with 15-year-old budding actress Radon Chung while his wife, Bianca, was out of town. Radon Chong is the daughter of Tommy Chong, by the way. Mick Jagger was also mentioned in Mackenzie Phillips' memoir. Mackenzie Phillips was the daughter of the rock star John Phillips from the Mamas and the Papas, who, by the way, the two of them had an incestuous relationship. If you haven't listened to episode one, go listen to that one. John Phillips would throw all these big, huge parties, and he would invite all the rock stars over, and Mick Jagger came over all the time, and Mackenzie Phillips apparently was always, like, really into him, as were all the girls, and when she was 18... They hooked up, and apparently Mick Jagger said to her, I've been waiting for this since you were 10. Jerry Lee Lewis was a rock and roll pianist who was famous in the 50s. In 1957, he married his 13-year-old cousin. Her name was Myra Gale Brown, and she was actually the ex-wife of Jerry Lee Lewis's cousin. And he actually was a member of Jerry Lee Lewis's band. Myra said that she felt ready to get married, she wanted to have babies, and she felt that she was ready for this. But it's also said that Myra still believed in Santa Claus when she married Jerry. It's also said that when she moved in with him, she packed up her belongings and the only thing she had, her dollhouse. They would end up having two kids together, although their son ended up dying. Unfortunately, he had a drowning accident at the age of three. The two of them would eventually divorce. Another reason that Myra thought this relationship was totally normal was the fact that Elvis Presley had been dating Priscilla, who was also underage. 
Elvis and Priscilla met when she was just 14 years old. She said that his attention quickly overwhelmed her, and by age 17, she was living with him in Graceland. There's a lot of disagreement about this. Priscilla did move in with him pretty much right away, and she started hanging out with him at 14, but she herself has said that they didn't have sex until she was 21 when they actually got married. Supposedly, he withheld sex. She says that he thought she was too young and insisted on waiting. People who were close to him have said that he had kind of a fascination with keeping a girl's virginity intact. There was a rumor that he bragged about two 26-year-old women who were virgins that he was hooking up with. An airman named Curry Grant was the guy who introduced Elvis to Priscilla, and he said about the night that they met, Presley soon had Priscilla backed up against the wall kissing her. At 8.30 p.m., he took her up to his bedroom, and they did not emerge again until 1.30 a.m., when it was time for Grant to take her home. It sounds like throughout the years the two of them were together, they didn't engage in actual penetration, but they had all kinds of other sexual activity. Priscilla was quoted as saying, I was someone he created. I was just a kid, and I was consumed by him. All I desired was not to disappoint him. It was once said about their relationship, I'll give you Elvis's relationship with Priscilla in a nutshell. You create a statue, and then you get tired of looking at it. Priscilla reportedly one day told him that she was no longer in love with him and she wanted to separate, and he apparently flew into a rage and raped her. It's also been stated that Elvis had three girlfriends as young as 14 years old who he kind of took with him on tour. Apparently, they would also all have sleepovers at his house. These girls were named Frances Forbes, Gloria Mowell, and Heidi Heisen. So at these little pajama parties, apparently he taught the girls how to put on eye makeup just the way he liked it, heavy on the eyeshadow and the mascara. And then they would kind of have like little tickle fights and they would kiss. And apparently sometimes it went a little bit past kissing. One night, they were all having one of these little sleepovers in his bedroom, and all the girls got naked, but Elvis decided to stay in his underwear. They listened to his records and fell asleep in his arms. A former member of his entourage had said, He was fascinated with the idea of real young teenage girls. It scared the hell out of all of us. In 1956, Jackie Rowland, who was 14 years old, went to an Elvis Presley concert with her mother, Marguerite. They were super excited to be invited backstage, but Marguerite got a little bit concerned when Elvis took Jackie off to his side room. A few minutes later, she opened the door to find Elvis teaching her daughter how to kiss in a grown-up way. He apparently asked her if he could take Jackie to a bar, promising to take really good care of her. But Marguerite had seen enough. Okay, so I have one more person to tell you about, but this one is a bit much, so I want to give a quick trigger warning before I continue. This one is about a young child, so if you need to skip forward about a minute or so, go ahead and do so. Ian Watkins was the lead singer of the rock band Lost Prophets. In 2013, he was sentenced to 29 years of imprisonment for multiple sexual offenses, including the sexual assault of young children and babies. He had these two fans who were in their 20s. One had a baby girl and one had a baby boy. Ian convinced both of these women to sexually abuse their children, and they both were prepared to make the children available to him for sex. One of the women was jailed for 14 years, and the other was sentenced to 17 years in prison. Ian admitted to the attempted rape and sexual assault of a child under 13, and he was sentenced to 29 years in prison with a further six years on license, but he will be eligible for parole after serving two-thirds of his term. All right, so that's all I've got for this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know this one is a little bit of a shocker, and I also know that some people are going to argue with me with some of the details. I do work really hard on my research, and I try my best to verify the sources that I'm looking at, but if you know something I don't know or I'm wrong about something, please feel free to send me an email or something and let me know. You can contact me using the website brokenlimelight.com, or you can just shoot me an email at ddwest at brokenlimelight.com. Don't forget, you can always contact me to suggest a case that you'd like me to cover. You can also check out the website to find show notes and pictures about the episode. I want to give a couple quick shout outs to people who donated to the podcast recently. 
Maria Obando, and Brinkley Schubert. Thank you so much for sending in a donation for the podcast. It truly means the world to me. Just so you guys know, anytime anybody sends me a donation of $5 or more, I give them a shout out on the podcast. And for anybody who sends a donation of $20 or more, I send them a free t-shirt. I appreciate all your support so much. If you enjoy my podcast, please be sure to tell your friends and give me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this. Until next time, bye-bye.